All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, we got quite a few people coming in still, um, but we'll we'll bring them in as they come in. Um, welcome everybody to the Fire Environment Continuing Education Subcommittee uh, monthly webinar. Today's webinar will be on Fire Guard with our guest speaker Sean Triplett. Um, just real quick, um, for those that may be new to these webinars, um, this webinar is presented to you today by the Fire Environment Continuing Education Subcommittee. Um, we are a branch subcommittee from um, FENCE, which is the Fire Environment National Committee. And uh, we focus on the tool sets uh, specific to fire behavior, fire currents, uh, fire weather, smoke, or risk assessment tools. And we're, we're primarily focused on that continuing education piece um, that, that brings these analysts and, and everybody that's interested in the fire, fire environment and works in the fire environment along as technology and tools change. So welcome everybody. Uh, real quick, a few webinar rules. Uh, for questions, uh, please use the chat feature or raise your hand and we will unmute you when called upon. Um, please stay on mute during the presentation. If uh, somebody does pop off mute by on accident, I will mute you. Um, also, please keep your webcam off uh, during the presentation. That'll just help with the bandwidth um, that some folks may have. And if any questions that are not answered during the presentation, um, we will follow us up with, with um, emails afterwards uh, to make sure everybody's questions get answered. With that, I'm going to uh, present our, our presenter today, Sean Triblett. Uh, thank you for joining us, Sean. Uh, Sean works as the tools and technology um, team lead for the Forest Service out of the National Interagency Fire Center in NIFSI. Uh, that's in Boise, Idaho. Um, and with that, Sean, I'm going to pass uh, the presentation to you, and I'll let you take it away. All right. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Sean Triplett, uh, like I said, with the Forest Service, I work at the National Fire Center. Um, I work in what's called the Tools and Technology Program, um, and I have uh, quite, a, quite a few different programs in the portfolio. The one I'm going to talk about today is FireGuard. Um, so FireGuard's a program where we're working to basically bring in as much data as we can, remote sensing information uh, to detect and monitor fires um, across the country. I'll get a little bit more of how we do that and why we're doing it. Um, so really, uh, the, the, what got the program started in the capacity that we're in today, um, in 2010, um, a letter was sent to Congress um, after the fires that we had in Texas and Oklahoma around the holidays. Um, basically saying, hey, you know, the <clears throat> Department of Defense spends a lot of money um, on technology. We know there's capabilities out there. Is there anything we can do to use those for fire support? And that's not to say that we weren't exploring and using these technologies before that, but this was really a catalyst to kind of got that moving forward. Um, and that letter was actually drafted uh, and signed by Kim Christensen, who um, recently moved out as the chief of the Forest Service. Uh, and that was when she was working uh, within the state of Arizona. Um, so at that time, we kind of got our heads together as a group um, with the Department of Defense, myself and some others, and looked across the portfolio of assets that were available to us. And um, we came up with a program where we were able to pull in data from multiple sources and detect a heat location every 30 minutes. So very similar to what we see with MODIS and VIRS, just kind of on a more repetitive pattern. Um, and that process was stood up. It was a very uh, analog process at that time. We actually had, um, we were using pagers uh, and basic simple text messaging to one, validate that the product worked and two, to see you know, how useful it was so we could answer back to Congress on the applicability of the data. Uh, in 2014, we had the, the Pioneer Fire here uh, in uh, north of Idaho City. Uh, I spent quite a bit of time uh, on that fire in different capacities, uh, and knowing what I knew at that time, I started kind of thinking about the Hawkeye program itself and what we could do to uh, improve it uh, in support of firefighting. So after that fire season, I met with a bunch of folks, uh, threw some requirements out at them, and see what we could do to improve uh, fire detection and monitoring. At the same time, a group had convened um, at NIFSI. Uh, interagency group of subject matter experts across the pro, uh, fire community to really look at a gap analysis and what we call our incident awareness and assessment program. 
And we looked at detection, we looked at mapping, we looked at monitoring, we looked at all those different business areas. And the one gap that we know that we had, and it's our greatest gap, is that persistence. So the ability to loiter or stay over a, a specific geographic area and detect or monitor and map fires consistently. We knew that we could bring up um, the NIROS program or other, other aircraft and other paid capabilities to fly over fires, but that's a kind of a one-time deal. Um, so that NREC group, um, still around, still began really exploring data sources, uh, and it's what we could do to keep um, building out that capability. Um, Zach Holder's running that group now. Um, he's the IAA coordinator there in, in Forest Service Operations, and I believe he said we're going to be getting together again this year to maybe update that, that analysis. Out of that, we came up with a pilot program that started in the state of California in 2019. So it was a partnership between the Forest Service, uh, CAL FIRE, uh, and California National Guard to look at what we could do to start to close that gap. And through the 2019 season, we found it to be highly successful. Uh, CAL FIRE um, was able to use it on quite a few fires uh, and, and asked to continue um, beyond the pilot. Um, so in uh, 2020, our favorite friend COVID popped up and I got a call in from uh, the national office, uh, some leadership asking me, is there anything in my portfolio that we can do to limit the exposure and risk to firefighters and also the general public? If you remember back in early COVID, we had no idea what wildfire smoke emissions were going to do, air quality for those that were impacted with COVID. So started looking across my portfolio and I said, well, we could take FireGuard nationwide, it would take some work, but um, you know, and that could give us either early alerts in, of, of new fires or alerting of when fires were basically getting up and making runs, which was gonna result in smoke. Uh, to accomplish this, we had to do a national RFA, which is a request for assistance um, to the Department of Defense and say, hey, we've got this program going with the state of California, we're paying through uh, Cal Fire to the state of California National Guard, um, but we'd like to move this out to a national level. And to do that, we would have to get their permission. So um, we began that process, uh, had to jump through a bunch of hurdles, um, but when we finally got approval uh, in 2021, or 2020, um, the California and Colorado Guard um, stood up and basically covered the country. And I'll talk about how that happened. Um, one thing to note is that the California shared some of their knowledge base with the Colorado DFPC um, in the state of Colorado National Guard units. And so they started a pilot project that summer just looking at some fires there in Colorado in 2020. But we did go nationwide uh, late September, early October. So what is FireGuard? Again, it's a national program where we pull in uh, multiple sources of data to detect and monitor fires. Um, I will say, and I'll talk about it a little bit more, it's detection is not its primary capability, um, but it is something that can be used for that. Um, our hope is as we get um, more data available and get through some, some hurdles that we're able to, to share this data out to get a better assessment of you know, fire behavior, maybe looking at rates of spread and intensity, but it also gives you just a general understanding of what the fire is currently doing uh, when it's burning. Um, recently this year, we're, we were able to get um, the ability to provide information every 10 minutes. Um, and so really what we're doing is we're providing heat. We're not providing fire perimeters. We're not providing fire polygons. We're providing areas of mapped heat. Uh, and we're in the process of building out the complementary product with other, uh, other programs that we use out there. So like the Colorado MMA, NIROPS, uh, FIRUS out of the state of California. Uh, and some of the end product contracts that NIFSI has in place with the Incident Awareness and Assessment Program, including DRTI. So again, FireGuard provides you a general area of the fire that's on that's burning, so the detected heat, um, but not the overall uh, fire. Uh, when we do provide current weather conditions, I'll talk about that in a little bit, but we have some FME scripting that runs in the back end, so we enrich the polygon data to be on just a detected area of heat. Um, currently, we're staffed by the two National Guard units, the one in California, one in Colorado, but we also have federal um, folk, uh, staff that's helping us, and there's actually state um, entities that help us per, um, with this product. So the one thing it's not, it's not a tactical tool. 
it's not meant to be, hey, the fire's on this side of the river or hey, the fire's on this side of the road. Um, it's, it's more of a tool to give you a general awareness of what the fire is doing. So we really don't want someone to look at this data and commit tactical resources to an area. Uh, just there's, there's too much risk with that right now. Uh, it's not a mapping tool. Um, it's not designed to go out and say, this is what the fire perimeter is and this is what the fire is actively doing. Again, it's giving you a general location of where the fire is actively burning at a given time. Um, and we really haven't set this tool up as a design to beat or replace 911 calls. Um, our false positive rates are less than 1% of all the detections that we do, but we're not out to beat 911. Um, some people who um, critique or try to use this data like to throw up uh, Irwin and dispatch call numbers, and that really doesn't mean anything to us because we're really not trying to beat 911. So why are we using FireGuard? Again, we're using it to fill that gap, that consistent, persistent coverage of either multiple fires or that large geographic area. So think of a whole forest or the entire Great Basin or something like that. Uh, so as we know, most of the capability we have now can either go from a division up to potentially mapping a whole fire over a given time, but nothing that can cover multiple fires, multiple areas at one time. Uh, and then we're also able to provide coverage and resources when traditional things are not available. I'll talk about that here on the next slide. Um, but some, some um, highlighted fires that we've supported over the past few years, the Creek Fire, um, <clears throat> you see the uh, uh, imagery there. Um, Fire Guard was instrumental in, in helping the pilots navigate in to rescue the 200 civilians um, that were surrounded and trapped uh, at Mammoth Pools. Um, it, on the Marshall Fire, uh, and some of those other fires, it was the only piece of information we had because of the wind and atmospheric conditions had grounded all the aircraft. Uh, and so fire guard was really the only piece of intelligence that the firefighters on the ground had. So this is an animated uh, slide of the Marshall fire that happened this year. So you can see we're not necessarily getting a progression, but you're getting a, an idea of, of what the fire guard was able to do. Uh, to support uh, that fires that burned up there in Boulder County in Colorado. Um, fortunate enough that the state of Colorado and the Colorado Guard have a very good relationship with Boulder County and the city of Boulder. Uh, so they were able to get the GOPDFs and information out to the, the fire as quickly as they could map it. Um, uh, and it was uh, a very successful fire for us. And again, think about that time frame. New Year's, not a lot of people uh, available for fires, not a lot of aircraft available, um, but because our program is 365 days, uh, our analysts were right on it when the fire broke. Uh, this is the beginning of the Caldor fire. So let's see if this plays. So here's, a, a, uh, as the, the Caldor fire began to, to move, you can see it's moving up the canyon there. If you look at the, the metadata on the right, this is where I was talking about enriching or enhancing the, the data. So we have FME scripts that goes out and pulls uh, NDFD data. So we get the, the weather, for, weather observations for that area. Um, we also go out and pull some other information about jurisdiction and any values at risk um, for that area. So analysts has drawn a polygon to just show where areas of heat are, um, but that then we have the GIS run in the background. So when the polygons produce, it enriches the data. Uh, and so that end user has a more, um, more intel about what's actually happening in that area and on the ground for firefighters. So this gives you an idea uh, in 2021 of the coverage we have. Um, so the areas in blue are the GACs that are covered by the Colorado unit. Areas in green are the units that are covered by the uh, California unit. Um, that doesn't mean that they just stay within their AORs. Um, at any given time, uh, California could ask Colorado to cover areas for them or, or vice versa. And that's happened quite a bit based on activity or system status or just uh, the number of analysts that's on. Um, <clears throat> but it's a, and we, we use FireNet extensively to chat and share information, and communicate back and forth. So it's a very collaborative effort between the two entities where we reach out and cover uh, the entire country. Um, it's pretty hard to see in the east, but we have supported numerous fires in Florida and all across the east. Texas has been a big user of it, especially this year. Uh, and last year we did quite a bit of work up on the Arrowhead um, in the Boundary Waters area of, of Minnesota. So pretty good at covering the whole country, um, but we're not, you know, 100%. 
Uh, this is just an analytics dashboard. And when I'm done this presentation, I'll show you what this dashboard looks like in real time. But we uh, just have a simple ArcGIS online environment built uh, to have real time tracking of the progress of the units. Um, again, I'll show you that in real time when I'm done the presentation. So really where this slide comes in is, you know, how the system works. So when we first started the system, we were actually building what we called spot reports based on um, some business processes that CAL FIRE had in place. And they worked great. We built GOPDS that had a, a map of the fire uh, and, and other relevant information. <clears throat> and then those were emailed out um, to basically a mailing list within CAL FIRE, uh, Forest Service, and other entities and cooperators in California. Um, as the program went live, we realized that one, it, you know, we need to be able to build, um, increase the productivity of the analyst. So that would mean not um, having to build the spot report, but also we really wanted to make this an end user driven experience. So have the user drive what information they wanna see, when they see it and what area to see it in. So we took advantage of the, the NIFSI org, um, some great support from that, that group. Uh, we built a survey one, two, three form. And really what um, that does is it allows the user uh, to go in and request uh, data or re request support. So you can request it if you're a duty officer and you've got red flag warnings and dry lightning in the area. You can draw an AOR and say, hey, I need detection or support in this area. Uh, if you're a SIT unit leader, or ops or whoever on an ongoing incident, you can draw in and say, hey, we're gonna be, you know, you can put information or we're gonna be conducting burnouts in this area. I'd like to just have you keep an eye on it and let us know what happens. And here's my contact information. Um, I'll need to up this slide, update this slide because we have integrated with the national um, IAA program. Um, but uh, the, the bottom line is, is we're, we're making this so you can drive how and what data you get. And right now you get alerts. Um, currently the system's only doing email alerts. We're working on getting text alerts stood back up, but you get an email alert that has all the information that you see on the screen there and some links so you can get in and quickly view the data. Uh, when that polygon's generated in the area that you've asked. Uh, we've also, uh, again, with the support of the, the NIFSI org team, built um, some web apps, uh, which are available you know, through your browser on your mobile phone or uh, in many of the different um, online uh, ESRI maps or mobile map uh, apps that ESRI's built. Um, and I'll show you an example of what that looks like in my browser, um, but you can also use field maps and other programs. So this is an example, interesting enough, of the Colorado fire in California. Again, this is one of those fires that was burning um, kind of in what we traditionally used to think of as our off season. Um, <clears throat> and we had some offshore winds here at night, uh, limited aircraft use by CAL FIRE, um, but they were able to leverage FireGuard to give them an idea of, of what the fire was doing, where it was headed as it um, impacted the, the PCH there. And when I bring in the next slide here, um, You'll see how, oops, I'm sorry, let me back up here. You'll see how the fire guard data relatively lines up with the what the actual final fire perimeter was, but it's, again, not 100% accurate, not meant to be a polygon. There are some errors with the data. There are some, um, and we're working to improve these. We're working to improve the accuracy and the temporal resolution of the data, uh, but it lines up pretty well, gives you a general knowledge of where and what the fire was doing at that time. Okay, the next slide is, don't take this for how every fire looks. This was a, it took several months to process the data to make it look like this. Uh, but this gives you an idea of the amount of, of support that we provided to um, the Dixie fire last year. Um, so I think over 1800 polygons were produced through the life of the fire. Uh, and you can see you get a pretty good idea of progression and spread um, for it. Um, I know I, I, we're working to be able to produce like this for every fire. There's still several hurdles that we have to get through to make this happen. It took a lot of work and time to build this product out. Uh, one of the neat things about this program, when you go back and take a look at it, and um, I'll let it play through so you can see it. Okay, so on this slide here, if you um, if you watch up uh, Lassen National Park up around Highway 36, 
uh, you'll notice that at the you'll start seeing some fires coming off the, the road there. It's it's pretty neat to see. Uh, at the time, we knew they were going to be conducting burn operations in that area. Uh, they had prepped that road, and you'll see some polygons start to pop up where they had burned off that road and were successful from keeping the fire coming at the road with a big head and jumping it. Uh, so some practical potential tactical use there, um, but more of really just an idea of getting an understanding of, of what we're doing with fire. And I'll go on to the next slide here for you. So again, uh, the little wrap up on the Dixie fire here. Um, you can see we had a, quite a bit of support, 1800 polygons. We had um, a lot of different RFIs on this fire, a lot of different customers coming in. Uh, we provided 24 seven support through the, uh, the life of that fire and some specific areas where we focused our attention uh, when we were uh, supporting this fire. This is just one of, of many fires. Again, I'll show you some other um, programs here in a minute of, of where we're at actively working. So where are we going? So FireGuard itself is just one of, of many incident awareness and assessment programs. So, so many of you are probably familiar with the FIRES program or DT, DRTI and other platforms. We're really working to be able to integrate those into a seamless system so we can do what, what's called a, a tip and queue process. So if one system or one capability detects or monitors something on a fire that's of important, it can share that amongst the platforms. We don't need the humans in the middle. We don't need uh, dispatchers calling between different platforms and programs. Uh, we can have the systems talk to each other. Um, we've built out a site, again, with the great support of the, the NFC org staff to what's called our IAA hub, <clears throat> which is a link here. And really that's to where you would go to get current information about this program or any of the other uh, incident awareness and assessment platforms that we currently work with. Uh, we're really working to uh, see how we can build FireGuard data out so we can use it in planning, operations, and research. Um, but we're, you know, we're a very young program. We still don't really have a stable budget. Um, it's, it's a year-to-year -year budget request, a year-to-year -year staffing request, uh, working to try to solidify the program so we can continue to build it out. Uh, and then, like I said, we're really working on interoperability. So any data set that comes in from FireGuard, DRTI, FIRES, Colorado MA, we really want to make all those programs interoperable and share data amongst each other. So that, that's really what our end state is, is trying to you know, take all these multiple tools and make them available. So what does that look like? So here's how we're doing it. Um, you know, we, we started building some notional architectures uh, to where we can bring in the systems and bring in the debtor better um, and more uh, seamless. Um, we're implementing systems like ATAC or TAC, uh, recently came out with ITAC, so it works on your iPhone where we're able to integrate uh, resource tracking, so firefighter tracking and full motion video, and uh, working with uh, <clears throat> some non-standard partners like the FBI, and Customs and Border Patrol and Secret Service to build out capabilities for uh, ESRI uh, feature service integration and, and more enhanced uh, full motion video integration into the TAC platform. Uh, those who are familiar with TAC, it's a very robust platform to support the DOD. Uh, but the CivTAC or the version that we're able to use uh, just doesn't play well with the enterprise systems that we traditionally use on fire. So we're working to make that happen. So with that, um, this is my contact information, but I'm gonna actually minimize this and show you a couple slides here. Um, so this was the, can you guys still, let me actually let me switch screens here for you, sorry. Let me just share again. I'll just share my desktop this time. There we are. Okay. You guys see my screen now? Yes, we do. Thanks, Sean. Okay, great. Yep. So this is our current uh, dashboard that we have. It's in real time. Um, it, it's tied into all of our feature services that we're using. So as you can see, we've got uh, supported 2,100 fires this year, over 20,000 polygons created. We break it down by state. You can break it down by uh, facilities. So Colorado, California, pretty interesting that we're just about split even in the amount of work that's done. Um, and we also are able to, um, to monitor um, prescribed fires. We've tapped into as many prescribed fire notification systems that we can find. So if we see heat, we're able to, to do some analysis, uh, multi-source analysis and detect that that's a prescribed fire versus a wildfire. Um, we break it out again out by landowner um, and then by GAC. 
Um, so you can see um, the predominance of activity this year with the Southwest having the early fire season and continuous fire season, and of course the PL5 experience of Alaska. Uh, current fires that we're supporting are you know, predominantly in Idaho, Northern California, Pacific Northwest. So I'll give you an example. So uh, this data is available in the EGP. Uh, and here's uh, an example of some fire guard data um, being created on the Six Rivers fires there. Um, and then we also have this web app um, where we've integrated what tracking devices we have. So the BLM uh, tracking system and some other. Um, <clears throat> and this can all be uh, read through a, a ESRI mobile app such as Field Maps, which many of you will use if you go out on incidents. This is actually the fire on one. Um, not a whole lot of activity today. The monsoons kind of came in on us, but yesterday we did make some pretty significant runs. Uh, and you can see where the fire guard data kind of lined up with what the, the NIROPS or infrared uh, showed us. So that's really what I have for my presentation. Thank you, Sean, appreciate it. Um, we do have one question in the chat. Um, from Christopher, he asks, are there any geographic limitations on how it compares to VIRS? Ge well, um, there, there are two different platforms. So there are some geographic limitations with, I, I wouldn't say there's limitations. They're, they're basically two different systems. So it's pretty hard to compare the two. You know, they're complementary to each other and that they both um, have the ability to to map or detect fires. Um, but I would really, um, really wouldn't want to say that there's limitations between the two. They're just kind of two different platforms where VIRS is a component of our system. We use it to feed into our data. But really, VIRS is a, a satellite, as we know, that comes over you know, every four to six hours, depending on your geographic location in, in the, on the US, um, where FireGuard takes VIRS, takes MODIS, takes all those different data sources and combines them together to produce that product. And so that's why you're getting that every um, <clears throat> uh, 10 minutes. Um, I saw the one question about how you sign up for alerts. Um, if, uh, I, and I can share that link out um, or someone want to put it in the chat. That's the IAA hub. You can go log in there with your NIFC org account. And then there you can fill out the form to get alerts and draw your area of interest. Um, I would say don't draw the whole United States because uh, you probably will get a little overwhelmed with alerts. So be, be judicious when you're picking that. Thanks, Katie, for doing that. Um, the other question was, how does heavy smoke impact this? Um, it, this is very similar to how NIROPS and other programs work. Heavy smoke is really not an issue. Um, I would say that it's where the bigger problem is, is sometimes the smoke um, depending on how how high it gets up into the atmosphere and how much it works, it can be can provide a limitation. But but smoke is really not a problem for it. That's the advantage of using multiple sources of data. If one system is a little um, little limited because of a uh, smoke or atmospherics, we can we uh, can use other systems to help us overcome that hurdle. But it's not the panacea. It has its limitations, just like every system does. Thanks, Sean. It looks like uh, Zeke has his hand up. Do you have a question, Zeke? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm interested to know whether or not um, there's any uh, benefit or opportunity to consider additional uh, uh, facilities or uh, uh, groups um, and um, you know whether or not um, the products across the country uh, in other parts of the country, I'm thinking specifically of Alaska, would be served by uh, another uh, uh, unit that's doing this or working on this? So that's a great question. And and right now, uh, we're, we're barely funded to keep the two units that we have. Uh, and I will say there's a pretty extensive amount of training that goes on to, to make this product. Uh, we have um, trained uh, analysts from other parts of the country. Um, and actually, um, at one time, uh, we did send uh, two or three um, of our analysts up to Alaska and met with them. Um, and it, having analysts in one particular area for this um, is, is not advantageous, really, to a ge geographic area. Um, this is something where you can work um, virtually or remote. Um, and then this year with PL5 uh, in Alaska and the amount of activity we had, um, working with the unit in California, which is who covers um, Cal uh, Alaska, 
uh, at no time did they come to me and said that they were overworked or were beyond capacity. Um, we have triggers in place where if that were to happen, we would call on uh, analysts from Colorado to backfill behind them. Uh, during the, the busy times last year with the extended PL5, um, we also um, did not have any capacity issues with the analyst. But I think what's important there um, is to recognize that this is a year-to-year -year funded program right now. Um, it's, not a, it's not a sustained investment. Um, a lot of us are doing this as the typical NWCG fire model, other duties as assigned. Uh, Katie, who provided the uh, link to you, um, we're fortunate enough that the Park Service allows, her to, allows us to call on her quite a bit. And she does great work for us. Brian, I see you got your hand up. Hey, Sean, this is uh, really great stuff. Thanks for, uh, for doing this webinar. Um, hey, are there, you mentioned MODIS and VIRS, are there other sensors that are used to generate those polygons? Yeah, there's there's quite a few. I'm not gonna get into a whole lot of details of them, but we have a lot of data that goes into this. And that's why we, we call them multi-source analysts. So these, uh, we it's pretty extensive training, like I said, that we go through where you learn how to bring in data from quite a few different um, programs. Um, we have a, a FireNet group put together where the analysts are always talking and sharing information with each other. Uh, and then we actually have brought on recently um, a group that's called Collaborators. It's, uh, it's, a, it's something that's been built over the past 20, 25 years um, in the intelligence and DOD and Homeland Security community where they have uh, multi-source analysts who look at non-traditional sources of information like we all do, like social media and other things to where they can get alerts and information about fires. Uh, and they're, they harvest that uh, and share that information with us to kind of help us uh, keep, a, keep abreast of the fire situation. That's one of the things I didn't touch on this program is um, because we've been able to tap into the National Guard and, and other, you know, other organizations, you know, we're learning a lot about how they do business and we're hoping to be able to start applying that to um, our programs and they're doing the same with us. Um, I was lucky enough with uh, Chris Buzo from Department of Interior OWF to get invited and attend a, a National Guard training in Minnesota for incident awareness and assessment and we got to learn how they they stand up and support when they're asked by FEMA and other organizations, the Guard, to support. So we're all familiar with how Guard comes out and supports us. But it was good to learn how they or how they support when they do respond to other disasters. So it's kind of that knowledge share and, and building that we're getting with uh, other non-traditional partners. Okay, thanks. Just one more follow-up question. I, I guess I'm just, yeah, I kind of had heard that there was, um, you know, some you know, classified DOD uh, ass sources or sensors that were used in this. And so I'm kind of, it's, it sort of seems like there's probably a spectrum of, you know, um, quality maybe in terms of the, where the data is coming from. And like, and modus points can be pretty far off. I mean, beers is this huge um, improvement over, mm -hmm. over modus in terms of like confidence and of its location and stuff. Um, it, do you find that, that in terms of the polygons that you're generating that like depending on the source that some are more accurate or more you know higher quality than others and i guess would there be a way to to pass that info on to the to the user to you know sort of be like okay this is a high confidence polygon and maybe you know i for me i, I don't even use modus anymore it's just like i just don't have you know veers is just way better it seems like that's a great question. So actually, we're uh, working on building confidence levels into the polygons. So um, if you and that confidence level is based on how many different sensors hit that that particular point, or how many um, if they if it's an ongoing fire and the progression of the data makes sense, that increases the analyst confidence and they'll flag that in the polygon. So that is a a process that we've started. Um, you know, like I said, last year was really our first year of operations. And so now we're maturing enough to where we're, we're getting analysts comfortable enough that they can start putting in that confidence. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting, you know, MODIS is, of course, it's degrading in orbit anyway. So it's it's going to be potentially going on its way. Um, and VIRS, yeah, I mean, it's it's got its, I mean, I, I will say I'm not a big believer in VIRS. I've seen it bloom out too many times, especially on some of the large plume dominated fires we have down here, but it's a piece of information. So it's one of the things that's great about the analysts is they can look at it and they can look at other things and start making those calls. Um, and 
Uh, absolutely, the feedback, that's part of the mechanisms that we're building. Uh, so you could go in, not only request information, but you can provide feedback. Um, and I, myself, and like I said earlier, we have state and other fire folks that are working with the analysts. Um, even recently on this fire, as of yesterday, I was providing feedback to the analysts saying, hey, can you guys go back and take a look at this area? Because you've put some polygons where it doesn't make sense. Uh, so we're still refining that process. Um, in regards to accuracy and things, we know we're off at times. I mean, you, you could see that on some of the slides that I shared with you. We're working to improve that. Um, and we're working to improve the trade craft of the analyst, but it, it's going to take time. It's going to take experience. This is a whole new world for us um, that we're getting into. Great. Thank you. Hey, Sean. Mm -hmm. Hey, this is Chris. Yep. Hey, I, I, I think that your last statement was probably an, an understatement, and I think it really needs to be highlighted that that the feedback for this effort really is paramount to moving it forward and improving um, where it's at today and where it could be in the future. And that really depends on the people um, in the field, not just, you know, somebody with yourself with a with a great understanding of the of the resources that are being brought to bear, but but people that are on these fires that are receiving the data. And, and if it's if it's good, I think we need to hear about it. If it's bad, we need to hear about it. But we also need the input of what what would you like to see that could make this better if you had this plus something else or or whatever it, it, that critical that feedback is critical to to improving the process thanks chris zeke did you have another question i i'd like to ask about the 10 minute uh, return uh, i looked at uh, a number of fires and, and the polygons don't look like they represent that uh, what what is meant by that ten minute um, interval? Uh, I think you mentioned something about that in the presentation. So basically, that means if they see if they see data, if we're able to produce data, we can release it every ten minutes. That does not mean you're going to get data every ten minutes. That means you're not going to see a fire move every ten minutes. It just means that the way that the the analyst process is set up, the way that all of our data sources come together, we've been able to get it down to what we feel comfortable releasing in every 10 minutes. So like I said, when we started, we started with a comfort level of about 30 minutes, and now we're down to about 10 minutes. And again, that's a lot of the limitations there is, is processing and automation. We're trying to pull data from a lot of different sources to produce a product. And so right now we're at that 10 minute threshold. Um, we're rapidly reviewing automation. Um, I have several programs going with the Department of Energy, um, who is basically the civilian agency leaders in automation and artificial intelligence. Um, we've been working close with the Pacific Northwest Lab. Uh, we've been working close with MIT and Lawrence Livermore, uh, some very smart people helping us uh, understand how to use this data better and, and um, have uh, much better computer systems than we'll ever have in the civil space. So. Um, I'm going to put a plug in there. Stop trying to be an artificial intelligence agency. We're natural resource and firefighting agencies. Let's leverage people who do this for a living, like the Department of Energy. Um, and um, we're learning a lot from them. Um, and they're learning a lot from us. So we're hoping to be able to improve that, that, that time period. But right now, that's where we're at in terms of processing the data. All right, with that, uh, thank you so much, Sean, for joining us today. It was a great uh, presentation for FireGuard. And thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, we hope to have a topic available for next month as well. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone.